Okay, everyone, I think we'll get going. It's one minute past seven, and at BirdLife South Africa, we're usually prompt in the way we do things. Um, I'd like to welcome you all to another episode of Conservation Outcomes with BirdLife South Africa. I'm your host, Mark Anderson, and I'd like to welcome you, all of our viewers tuning in through Zoom and Facebook Live. If you'd like to communicate with us, please use the Zoom chat room, and remember to select all panelists and attendees if you want everyone tuning in to see your message. Please ask your questions to the speaker by using the Q&A box throughout the webinar. If you're watching us on Facebook Live, <coughs> excuse me, you can use the comment feed for your comments and questions. Our speaker will answer these at the end of the webinar. Please use the hashtag conservation conversations tag when referring to us in social media posts. If you've missed any of our previous webinars, you can catch up with recordings on the BirdLife South Africa YouTube channel or listen by our new podcast available on all major streaming services. Thank you to those of you who have con continued to donate generously towards the production of these webinar webinars using the Cricket Donation platform. You can simply scan the QR code or visit the Conservation Conversations webpage to find the link to the donation portal. Your contributions help us to keep these talks free for all to learn and enjoy. Anya and I spent the last weekend in the Northwest province with, um, with David and Karen Lawrence, with Peter and Val Thomas. While in the field, we made extensive use of various incredible apps on our cell phones. I'd like to encourage you to, who, those of you who do not have the tree app or the bird pro app, to purchase and use them. I'd also like to commend the Thomases for the many years that they've invested in developing these superb apps. This past weekend, during long discussions with Val, I again appreciated the importance of trees. Trees are important for many reasons, including for the services they provide to birds. Sadly, not everyone loves trees. We need to develop an appreciation for our country's trees and we need to protect them. South Africa would be a poorer place without its trees. Word of South Africa's Birding Big Day takes place this weekend on Saturday. Be sure to register your open or community team on our website and email any queries to Ernst Retief on bbd at birdlife.org.za. Birding Big Day is not just a competition, but a day where we celebrate the wonderful bird diversity we have in our country. You, compete, you can compete if you want to, but teams can also just spend a few hours in their local park or nature reserve logging the birds they encounter while enjoying being out in nature. As a collective, we should try and see how many of South Africa's birds we can see during Birding Big Day. Birding Big day. Last year, we saw 667 species. Let's see if we can get to 700 in 2020. I'd like to encourage you to be part of this incredible initiative, um, which is um, held, um, convened by BirdLife South Africa and this, with assistance from BirdLassa. I'm sure you all know that BirdLife South Africa is a membership-based organization, and we're very proud to have more than 40 affiliated bird clubs across the country that support BirdLife South Africa and its work. Many of the bird clubs are represented at this webinar tonight. If, you'd look, if you're looking to expand your birding horizons or want to find fellow birders to explore the fascinating world of birding with, we recommend visiting BirdLife South Africa's website and clicking the Support Us tab, where you'll find the link to join a bird club. Find a suitable club near, your, near you and enjoy the exciting social activities that are on offer. If you have any queries, you can email info at birdlife.org.za or shireen at membership at birdlife.org.za. Our calendar sales this year have done really very well. In fact, we've um, sold out. We're busy reprinting the calendars at the moment. And I'd like to encourage you to purchase these calendars. And they really have really beautiful uh, photographs. They make wonderful gifts. And of course, having one of these calendars, you can diarize the conservation, the conservation conversation webinars to ensure that you never miss um, a talk. You can go to our website and click on the tab at the top of the page. And you'll go then through to the web page where you can order your, your calendars. These calendars are used to support our um, magazine, African BirdLife magazine. Our final Africana Media monthly giveaway for November promises this month's winning an amazing collection of bird-related titles. We'll be announcing our final winner for 2020 at the end of tonight's webinar, so please stay tuned right till the end. A big thank you to Jakarta Media for supporting our webinars this year and partnering with us to bring our viewers an amazing selection of prizes. We're very excited to announce that November's winner of the final Zeiss Hygiene Hamper giveaway is Ted Droste. Thanks, Ted, for tuning in to Caroline's webinar last week. We'll be in touch with you to arrange delivery of your Zeiss Hamper in the next few days. 
This great prize will help our winner and your loved ones stay safe and sanitized during these uncertain times. Thank you to Zeiss for the amazing support of our, not only the webinars, but also the important work that we do. Most of BirdLife South Africa staff have loaned Zeiss binoculars, and we're very grateful to Gail Giordani and her team. Before I hand over to our speaker, I'd like to thank Melissa Howes Whitecross for all she's done since March to bring the Conservation Conversations webinars into our homes and for making Tuesday nights during COVID-19 so enjoyable and informative. Tonight is the 34th webinar, hard to believe, and that's certainly no mean feat. I believe that the Conservation Conversation webinars have been one of the highlights of 2020, certainly been a, one of my and Tanya's highlights. Very, very well done to you, Melissa. Tonight, I'm really excited to welcome Duncan Butcher to the final Conservation Conversations webinar. Duncan, um, who's probably familiar to most of you, he's a naturalist, an illustrator, and a photographer. He's written many books and popular articles, including books on the wildlife of the Okavongo, African Safari Journal, The Vultures of Africa, and Garden Birds in Southern Africa. He's worked on ecotourism projects as a consultant across Africa, and he studied wildlife in Borneo, Thailand, Australia, Peru, and Brazil. He's certainly very well traveled. But Duncan is a very, very passionate conservationist, and I have really enjoyed the times that I've spent with him drinking coffee and talking about conservation, quite about planet, planet and what we need to do to conserve our country's natural environment. A lot of you won't know that Duncan has an honorary doctorate from the University of Witwatersrand. Finally, it had to come out, Duncan. I was actually happy to be there when you received your honorary doctorate. Duncan is currently producing some beautiful vintage style posters. And I encourage you to visit his website and purchase a poster or two. They're really absolutely beautiful and they make great gifts. Thank you, Duncan, for coming on to Conservation Conversations tonight. And now over to you. How does that look? That's perfect. I'm going to mute and over to you for the next 55 minutes or so, Duncan. We look forward to it. Wonderful. Thanks very much, Mark. Thanks for the introduction and uh, welcome everybody to, to this webinar. And I feel very privileged to have been given the opportunity to uh, chat to you all this evening on a topic that, uh, that is really close to my heart and led to to a publication of a book some couple of years back. So, you know, thanks, thanks for inviting me to talk to the tribe. I think to a large extent, what I'm gonna to have to say this evening is probably preaching to the converted. I think most of you will be pretty much on track with what I have to say this evening. Uh, but but with, with all these conservation messages, it's, it's important that we spread that word. And, and the fact that BirdLife is now putting these webinars out on YouTube, I think there is potential for, for all these conservation webinars to really be noticed. And I hope this might be one of those. Um, last week's presentation was very fascinating. It, uh, it was put out by, by Caroline and her topic being urbanization and, and particularly how birds are utilizing the open spaces in Johannesburg. And, and it was very, very fascinating to see her data on, on the movement of birds and the density of birds in particular parts of that great metropolis of Johannesburg. I, unlike Caroline's talk and most of the others really in the series of webinars, uh, Tonight, I'm not presenting the results of any particular study. It's more of a casual talk based on the decades that I've been privileged really to spend watching birds in my own garden environment. Not, not all that many people really have their own gardens. And those of us who do should be very grateful always for that. Um, and I've certainly been blessed. I've, I've spent time living in Johannesburg as well as in Nelspreet. And now I'm sitting here talking to you right at the edge of Africa in the town of Hermanus, where we've been for about five or six years. Most of my experience with birds, certainly in terms of uh, manipulating an environment for birds, took place in Nelspreet. Um, so, some of the imagery you're going to see tonight is 
is relevant to that, but I've tried to try to make the talk as broad based as possible. Generally speaking, tonight, what I'll be talking about is what we now call rewilding. And it's a modern term for something that a lot of people have been doing for a very long time. People, people such as Keith Cooper of the Wildlife Society has been promoting uh, green spaces in urban environments since the 1980s. And many other people have, have been uh, championing that cause. I'm no expert in this field, but I've been lucky enough to have that opportunity to, to experiment and to, to see the results you can get from repairing nature and, and giving it a chance to, to recover. Uh, you know, we really have damaged a lot of the planet and it can get really grim and depressing to, to, uh, to make yourself aware of that. But on the positive side, nature has a way of fighting back incredibly. And, and I think we need to always try and keep on the bright side of life in terms of not giving up. And as big and as dense as our urban situations become, there's always going to be opportunities to to provide niches for other species. And that's what I'm really here to talk to you about this evening. Um, and basically giving all creatures that we share this planet with the opportunity to live out their lives, literally in the case of garden, gardening for birds, literally on our own doorsteps. So um, let's see where we go with this. To begin with, on my own doorstep, for 20 years was Taraco Wood. This was a property in Nelspreet, an urban property. Uh, luckily and, and, and deliberately, we chose, my wife and I, Tracy, we chose to buy a property that was adjacent to a nature reserve. And over 20 years, we basically allowed the nature reserve to take over our garden. We let, we let go of controlling the garden and, and the reserve took it over. And so these were the kind of birds that I would have to try and not look at while I was busy working um, at home. And over, over that period of time, I think probably we had about 180 different species of bird in our garden in Nelspreet, five different species of bush shrike, uh, three woodpeckers, and of course, the star of the show there always was the purple crested Taraco. Um, during, during the early phase of this hard lockdown that we all experienced uh, in South Africa and across the globe, we were all confined to our homes for longer than normal. And, but those of us who are lucky enough to have a garden and some trees and shrubs or more in the garden, uh, we found we got to know our garden birds a little better than we would have before. We spent a lot more time looking at birds right around us. And many of us probably realized that the birds that we share our garden spaces with were more interesting than we thought. And hopefully and probably we may have also come to realize how interconnected all of life in our garden is and how everything is, is interconnected and one thing depends on another. And as we were not allowed to even emerge from our houses and were confined to these small spaces, so we started getting reports of interesting behavior of, of wildlife and birds in what were now quiet uh, surrounding areas. And I know that Peter Ryan has been collating some of that information and is publishing it in the African BirdLife magazine. But what we all found, I think, living in our tiny spaces for those months at a time was that birds in our garden are really fascinating and, and they're fun to watch, but more than that, 
they provide us with an opportunity really to make the world a better place. That's how I choose to look at it. So uh, a lot of the talk this evening is based on this book that I put together uh, in 2017. And the theme of the book is uh, attracting, identifying and enjoying birds. It was published exactly 50 years after the first book of its kind in this part of the world, which was Garden Birds of South Africa, written and illustrated by the great Ken Newman, uh, who of course then went on to, to publish Newman's Field Guide to Birds, and which was really for a lot of us this evening, really was the first book that, that encouraged us to get out and look at birds. So a little tribute to Ken, and interesting that the two books are exactly half a century apart. One of the fascinating aspects looking at Ken's book uh, is the fact that in the, in the birds that he singled out to feature in Garden Birds of South Africa, there is no sign of the hardy dar ibis. It's completely absent from, from that book. Um, and it's then therefore a really interesting thing to look back on and reflect that, that birds like humans are adaptable and they, they occupy environments that change and the hardy dar absent from even the Western Cape, I think at that time is now a super abundant bird and a super, um, a super, um, annoying bird to a lot of people, but it plays a very important role in a lot of our gardens. On the topic of books, this is a, this is a marvelous to, to look out for, um, been published twice, originally in 96 and then again in 2010. And it's a book called Bring Nature Back to Your Garden. It's published, uh, written by Charles and Julia Boerter. It's still available today. You find it very often in used bookstores. I'm not sure if it's still in print. Quite likely it'll be up for a new edition if not. But it's a book which really digs deep into all aspects of the ecology of your garden. So if you're enthused by what I talk about this evening, go out and look for that book if you can. It'll provide a lot more supplementary information. So on the other side of the screen here, you can see what are obviously not birds, but these are the type of creatures and critters that uh, you, know, you can expect to find in your garden if you follow the rewilding route. And if you embrace the notion that your garden space should be returned at least in part to nature. So on the top of the, of the picture there, we have a, a, um, a courtship scene of two guttural toads. And if any of you have lived with guttural toads, you'll know that they are rather vociferous amphibians. And um, although that can at, at times be a little overwhelming, it's a creature that's able to drown out the, the sirens and the alarm systems and the general racket of suburbia. So the, the guttural toad is a great, creature in most respects to have in your garden. Featured down below is an interesting little uh, little creature called a wolf spider. And this is a female, which you can, you can tell by the fact that on her back are over a hundred little baby spiders, her offspring, and she's carrying them about as she goes off to hunt. Uh, the wolf spiders are actually uh, spiders that don't spin webs and they are the cheaters of the spider world. They run down their prey and they, they capture them uh, without, without the use of any technology in the form of a web. So as you go down the path of rewilding your garden, these are some of the non-bird species that you might get to know. Also here, Another, another creature which is often overlooked uh, visually, but can never be overlooked from the point of view of, of its vocal repertoire, and that is the cicada. 
And here we have on the left an example of a exoskeleton of a cicada. As, as most of you probably know, these creatures uh, develop underground and then they climb up as nymphs. They climb up uh, trees and over a period of time, they then split open in the process of metamorphosis and out will emerge the, the very uh, colorful and very, very noisy adult cicada, which are then potential prey items to some of the birds in your garden. So it's another, another component of nature in your garden is watching these invertebrates go through their life stages. So one of the questions that a lot of people will ask, this is a conservation conversation. It forms part of a series of conversation, conservation conversations, uh, bird life are putting out. But with so many endangered species to think about and to be concerned for, are garden birds at all important? Should we, should we even be worrying about garden birds in urban spaces? And, and my answer to that is fourfold. And um, firstly, just seeing garden birds lifts our spirits. It's, it's well known that, that humans um, benefit from a connection with nature. And seeing a garden bird does provide us with wonder and it provides us with beauty. And here's an example of that. You can't get much more wondrous or beautiful than a male Malachite sunbird. And then the second reason to look look at conserving and being uh, concerned for garden birds is that by creating niches for birds in our own gardens, we're benefiting the whole pyramid of biodiversity. Um, thirdly, rewilding, even on a very small scale, it provides an opportunity for you as an individual to make a real contribution to conservation, a physical, practical contribution. And no matter how small it is, it's a contribution. And fourthly, those of us who create uh, biodiversity reservoirs in our gardens through the rewilding process, we're, we're creating the potential for stepping stones in urban areas that then can act as corridors between bigger natural areas. And so by focusing on birds, recognizing the importance even of common birds like the, the bulbuls and the white eyes and the fiscal shrikes, it is important. It's vital in fact, because it's that, it's, it's, by, it's by looking after the foundation of natural processes, the, the base of the food pyramid that is, that is so critical to life on earth. So, this is an example of what a lot of people would consider to be a beautiful garden. Um, it's not my garden, um, and it's actually taken out of a homeowner's catalog, this photograph. I stole it off the internet. Um, but this is how a lot of people would envisage an, a magnificent garden. And actually, the reason I'm putting this up here is that in order to, to embrace the concept of rewilding, and, and making a garden that is suitable for birds and other life forms, we've got to get rid really of a lot of our tidiness habit, habits, a lot of our habits to be tidy. We, we like our kitchens to be tidy and clean. We like our bedrooms to be tidy and clean. We like, you know, we love to keep ourselves tidy. It's a human characteristic. But in the sense of a garden, being too tidy is actually counter productive when it comes to rewilding. So that's one of the big challenges for us to consider if we're really serious about making space for other life forms in our gardens. This is more like my own garden and these are some of the attributes that you would see there which is you know a patchy bit of lawn, a few little weeds coming through, a lot of fallen leaves and flowers just being left to decompose. This is, this is not my photograph. It's actually, um, it's, I think it's the only photograph here that's not mine other than that one we saw now of the, of the very tidy garden. 
Um, but I'm putting it up here because it, it's important globally to look at this. And, and of course, birds interest a lot of people all over the world. Millions of people are interested in birds. And it's not hard to realize why. They're colorful, they're lively, they sing, they get your attention, and uh, they respond to the way we modify the landscape. And they respond really quickly when we provide food for them. And in, in the Northern Hemisphere, particularly in the USA and in parts of Northern Europe, uh, a lot of people feed birds through the Northern winter, through the cold snowy months, when a lot of birds or certainly populations of a lot of species would really, would really plummet uh, as they would struggle to find food during these really cold, super cold, snowy conditions. Um, in fact, a huge industry um, worth probably worth millions of dollars and pounds and euros has been created for, for people to purchase various food packages and food types for their backyard birds. And uh, it's, it's, it's certainly the case that, that the, that these birds have attached themselves to, to the human beings who actually see them through these cold and bitter months. In Africa, certainly here in South Africa, Southern Africa, we have a very much milder climate. And I don't personally believe we really should be feeding birds artificially. I think we should be reconsidering the whole notion of actually feeding our garden birds. Um, interestingly, um, a lot of the people in those other countries, and especially also here in South Africa, a lot of the people who feed birds in their garden um, are, are often the very same people that are using some of these products um, that, are that, are, that are shown on the bottom of the screen here, these pesticides and herbicides that keep our keep the foliage of our plants perfect and prevent, prevent our trees and plants from being consumed by characters such as this hawk moth caterpillar here, who's busy munching through the leaf of a cabbage tree. Uh, so there's a certain contradiction. We love colorful birds and we love colorful butterflies, but we don't like to see our garden plants being eaten away by caterpillars or bugs and beetles. So all organisms on the planet, each and every one of them, are part of a food web or a food chain. And so the process of rewilding is to try and rebuild those food chains, even if it means going against our instincts of tidiness and, and embracing species that we're not that happy about or that could be problematic for us. We have to consider that maybe we need to we need to let down our guard a little and give these guys a chance too. And so in the case here of the white eye, everyone loves Cape white eyes. They're charming little birds. They're quite harmless and they're not going to threaten anyone. In the case of the paper wasp, it's a different story. It's an aggressive insect. It's territorial. It, uh, it, um, it often likes to build its, its paper nest under the under the entrance of a door or a, or a window and so we have to be a bit cautious when they're around but the paper wasp as one example is a predator of caterpillars and so having them around will actually enable gardeners to uh, let their plants flourish without without resorting to dangerous chemicals to, to kill off uh, the caterpillars. So often we've got to, we've got to actually consider letting, letting go of our, um, our biases against certain, certain animals in our garden spaces. Essentially, when it comes to rewilding, when it comes to creating a garden for birds, obviously, First and foremost, it's about the plants. We have, to, we have to think about growing as many plants as we can 
in our garden space that are locally native to the land that we're on. These are the plant species that have evolved with the climate uh, in that particular context. And these are the plant species that host the invertebrates that either uh, prey on, on their seeds, munch their foliage, or pollinate their flowers. And we need, to, we need to think about growing as many of those plants. Now, these are not usually the most beautiful plants often to have in your garden. And sometimes they can be quite inconspicuous plants. And I'm not saying that you have to fill your entire garden with them, but you should attempt to grow a high proportion of plant species that really are native to your particular area. And the way to establish what those plants are, are to try and look for some wild spaces around you, uh, climb onto the coppies or the hillsides or the riverbanks near to where you live and identify those species that are actually native to your own particular environment. Those are critical to building up this reservoir of biodiversity. This plant, incidentally, in the photograph, it's a female um, malachite sunbird. And the reason she's sitting on that plant, which is a wild camphor bush, Tarkinanthus, is that those fluffy uh, seed heads are used to line the nest in which the baby sunbirds will grow up. So she's come to that plant to gather the seed heads uh, for that purpose. As you know, most of you, um, insects, we keep getting this warning that, that insect populations all over the planet are crashing. Uh, we haven't, so far as I know, seen any demise of insectivorous bird species in most parts of the world. Um, but the numbers of those insectivorous birds must be dropping because the numbers of insects certainly are. The cartoon on the left is one that um, probably a lot of you have seen in some form or variation of another. And it's, it's basically telling that story of how 15 or so years ago, our windscreens were always covered with dead insects when we drove around. Whereas now, hardly an insect is to be seen a lot of the time on our windscreen. So that's a really great measure of the way that insect populations around the world have been decimated by monocultures, by, by massive urbanization, and probably also by just the superabundance of light, which, which draws so many insects to their, to their deaths around buildings. Um, so we have a real problem with insects and rewilding your garden and your space is partly about restoring insect populations. Here's some insects to take a look at. These little characters are uh, bugs, um, which are um, sap feeding bugs. They feed on a particular fluid within, within growing parts of plants and they can, they can really hamper the growth of a plant. They may even be able to kill a plant if there's enough of them, uh, but as you can see on the right, they've got their own, they've got their own predators to worry about. And here we can see a, a hairy robber fly, quite a magnificent moustache and beard that little uh, robber fly seems to have. And he's caught one of these bugs and is busy dealing with it. But the robber fly, of course, better look out because a paradise flycatcher or a dusky flycatcher is looking out to make a meal out of him. And these interrelationships and food webs are, are marvelous things to watch and record and document and photograph in our own garden spaces. So for about 20 years, I lived in Johannesburg um, before moving down to the subtropics of Nelspruit, And much of the northern suburbs of Johannesburg now looks like this. It's actually often referred to as the world's biggest man-made forest. It's, it's got a mix of uh, um, African, South African trees, a lot of European trees, jacarandas from Brazil. But 150 years ago, this was grassland. 
and it was the habitat for birds such as the Cape Longclaw and the Rufus Snake Lark. Those birds have gone and they've been replaced by species like the three above here, the green wood hoopoe, the ring-necked parakeet and the common miner. The last two are non-indigenous species that have followed humankind and are exploiting these niches that we've created for them. And uh, birds are very adaptable and they will move in and out of habitats as we modify them. So your garden is really a microcosm of, of this great urban picture here. You can, you can alter your garden in such a way that you can attract different species to it. Uh, one, of the, one of the species that has taken hold in Johannesburg is this little guy. Uh, he goes by the name often of the Parktown Prawn. And uh, this one is missing a leg or front part of his leg. Uh, they are actually native to the forests of uh, the South Pondsburg and other parts of, of the warmer eastern parts of Southern Africa. But they found somehow their way to Johannesburg. And, you know, some of you might have, like I have, had to confront one of these uh, at a particular time in your life as it's, uh, as it's hopped towards you. Um, in, in, in an attempt to get it out of your kitchen or room or wherever. These are quite, quite um, aggressive critters. And one of, the, one, of the, um, one of the birds that come to look after them is this, this one, the hardy da ibis, which uh, will, will seek out the parktown prawns that are foraging in your garden and restore that, uh, that balance so that you don't have too many too many of them trying to get in to frighten, frighten your family. Uh, of course, the hardy dark can frighten you as well. It's a rather raucous bird. Um, and this is the character that I was talking about earlier, completely absent from uh, Cape Town 30 years ago. It's now not only in the suburbs of Cape Town, but it's, it's actually foraging along our beaches here and using that bill to probe through the kelp as if it was evolved to do so. So the hardy dars are very charismatic and quite um, difficult bird to, to ignore in our garden spaces. So as I mentioned, uh, this is a page from the book, but essentially what we have to do in our garden is we have to create habitats and micro habitats to create a different structure for different life forms. One of the things you can uh, do in a garden immediately to bring birds and other biodiversity in is to provide water on a constant basis. Uh, if you have a permanent bird feature, uh, water feature, birds will come quickly to that. And if you go further than that and build somehow a, a garden pond or even a, a, a artificial stream of moving water, then you get a whole host of other uh, invertebrates and amphibians, hopefully, and maybe even one day a kingfisher or a hummercock to come and complete the cycle of life. Uh, this is uh, there are many ways to build uh, nature. This is this is one of them. This is a pond we made in Nelspruit, and eventually became home to, I think, about two hundred different species of of uh, animal. Um, including, as I mentioned, all the little insects and I think there were 12 different species of dragonfly. So dragonflies are becoming much more popular subjects for naturalists and for photographers. They're, they're marvelous little animals. Uh, we have a hundred or more species in South Africa and thanks to Warwick and Michelle Tarbiton's brilliant book, we can now go out and watch dragonflies much as we do birds and we can photograph them and we could submit our records of dragonflies to the ADU's virtual museum and log on records of dragonflies. They've become a very popular uh, group of animals to observe and photograph and a big attraction to any garden feature. Of course, uh, the big dragonflies feed on little dragonflies and the little dragonflies feed on damselflies and the damselflies feed on 
water striders, but the big dragonflies are preyed upon by bee eaters and fly catchers. So bringing them into your garden space is going to allow for quite a lot of uh, turnover of biodiversity. This is one of the more exciting things we all hope to see in our gardens. Um, it's a little predator. It's also a flycatcher of a kind, but it, of course, is a reptile. It's a flap-necked chameleon. And it's a very sensitive uh, animal in the sense that this is one of the first species to vanish in the face of pesticide use in your garden. And they quickly uh, accumulate poisons and pesticides in their bodies and the disappearance of chameleons over large parts of the country is a direct result of pesticide use. So having said all of that, obviously feeding naturally is the answer. This is what I'm trying to get across here is that we shouldn't be feeding our birds with uh, a fare on a bird table. We should be allowing birds to fit into an ecosystem and into a niche that we're helping to create for them. And what that means is that some of our gardens, some of the time, is going to look a lot like what we see on the left-hand side here. There's a group of beetles completely devouring the foliage of a bush. Um, but in turn, those beetles will be preyed upon. My own philosophy with insects and plants in a garden space is that if a plant needs protection from insects and invertebrates and doesn't bounce back from predation of its or, or herbivory of this kind, then forget about growing that species in your garden. Most of my plants in the Nelspray setting were devoured by insects, but all of them would always come back and sprout again. Remember that insects go through these life cycles. And so you could, in the early part of summer, have a plague or a, an abundance of a certain species. But then uh, over time, that species uh, plays out its life cycle, and then the plant has a chance to recover again. Uh, the plum colored starling or the violet backed starling is feasting on those beetles. You can see on the top. Whereas the bulbuls are, are berry eaters as well as insectivores. So another thing that I've had to confront and tackle in the book is this, and this is not part of rewilding. This is an example of not rewilding. This is artificial feeding. Um, I do accept that it's hugely entertaining. And if it's done properly, it's not harmful. If you, get the, if you get the mix of sugar water right, if you don't use artificial sweeteners, which will kill birds, and if you keep your water, sugar water bottles clean, and if you can find a way especially to keep uh, honeybees out from drowning, then I can, see, I can see the benefits, particularly for people who have very small garden spaces who still want to enjoy the wonder and beauty of birds, this is an attraction. And if it's, done, if it's done properly and carefully, I don't have a problem with it. In fact, it's quite a new um, activity in South Africa to provide these sugar water feeders, but it has been, it has been going on for a lot longer in, um, in, um, in other parts of the world, especially in, in tropical uh, Central America and in parts of the USA, it's, it's huge. And there, of course, it's hummingbirds that are being attracted to hummingbird feeders, which is exactly the same provision of sugar water. So another, another way to attract birds artificially for a quick fix in your garden, which some people do, and I've experimented this with myself, it's, it's a tool that a lot of photographers have used, is to grow mealworms. And this you can do in your garage, you can have a box and you can get up a mealworm farm going. And more than a few people I know have got birds in their gardens so tame that they will come and grab mealworms right off of their hand. Um, and again, it's not harmful, but it goes against what I'm promoting here this evening, which is rebuilding ecosystems and providing niches in your garden rather than simply 
drawing birds in for a free meal. So this is, this is more my idea of feeding for birds. And I'm a big fan of leaf litter. If you let the leaves just simply fall off your trees and, and decompose in your garden, not only are you keeping your garden space less dried out and moister for soil protection, but you're creating innumerable uh, niches for, for soil microbes, uh, tiny invertebrates, bigger insects, millipedes, any number of creatures that are going to live in and among leaf litter. And um, of course, certain birds, particularly thrushes, love to move through leaf litter. And remember, I'm not talking this evening about necessarily everyone turning the whole garden over to nature. I don't expect a whole hog on that, but even if you don't want to go that way, you can still devote parts of your garden to, uh, to a sort of an exclusion zone where you just let nature run its course. And there's always space for keeping your leaves this is, this is what I call a double nightmare, and a lot of you will see this all the time in your neighborhoods. Um, and not only is all this biomass and this, this soil nutrition being taken away from the garden, but it's being wrapped in plastic on top of that. So this is my idea of a double nightmare. Uh, when I was researching my book, when I was putting the book together, uh, I was living in a part of Hermanus called Vermont, and it's a particularly interesting and fascinating uh, area because the town planners actually created um, green, a green belt, several green belts through this, through this urban, uh, urban suburb. And so that, that actually created a lovely um, bridge between uh, the dune vegetation down at the sea and the Feinbos vegetation on the mountain. So when I was living there, there was a whole lot of birds moving through there way more than I expected for an urban environment. And what this little illustration shows is how these six common garden birds actually space themselves out in a typical uh, suburban setting. Some birds like the uh, Cape Robin chats require a very small uh, breeding territory. Uh, one pair occupies a couple of acres, whereas the, the Boo Boo Shrike, which is a more uh, vociferous bird, will need a bigger space. It, it feeds on bigger invertebrates. And then the spotted eagle owl, of course, needs an even bigger space still than that. And so this little diagram maps out the territories of known breeding pairs in, in an urban environment. And it illustrates a thing that not everyone can have an occupied owl box, for example, in their own garden. A lot of people want to know what sort of box they should put up to attract an owl to come and breed in their garden. But of course, if you've already got a pair of owls established five houses away, they're not going to give that up and come to your owl box necessarily, unless something goes wrong at some stage. So um, I thought I had an owl illustration here, but it's, it seems to have seems to have disappeared. So we may come back to owls in a moment, but for now. And this I'm leaving again a little bit, I'm going off script here because although this is not a component of rewilding, it is very much a topic of birds in your garden. It's something that, that a lot of people are concerned with and that is window collisions. And in fact, the collision of birds with glass windows, which of course they, they just see as a way through, uh, and they don't see an obstacle in their way, but the collision with glass is from, from what I've read is, it, is almost everywhere is a more significant mortality factor for birds 
than predation by domestic and feral cats. So it can take a very large toll of birds. And, and it seems that the only real way to, to combat that is either to, to keep curtains over your windows or, or put Venetian blinds on them or shutters. But of course, not, every, not all of us want to live like that. We don't want to have dark rooms a lot of the time. And so the, the thing that seems to work best are, are window stickers or decals that you put in particular places. And in my experience in living in different houses, there are always particular parts of your house, particular windows where birds tend to hit. And so those are the ones you would need to concentrate on. Window decals don't need to be ugly. And you can do very beautiful creative things now in this age of digital uh, printing. It's quite possible to design your own uh, window decals and most towns have digital printers now that can create uh, either frosted or white or black versions of designs that you can put on your windows. And this will really help with with actually preventing birds from thrashing into the glass windows. A lot of birds move around at night. This little character in particular, the pygmy kingfisher, is a, uh, a bird that moves around nocturnally and is, is, an, is frequently a victim of, of window collisions, the pygmy kingfisher. One thing last I want to say about this is that if you do have a bird strike, and you've got a bird that is stunned and appears to be dead uh, or pining for the fjords, um, then simply uh, the best thing to do is to pick that little bird up, put it in a dark space, ideally in a little shoebox, leave it alone really for half an hour, and then come back, open the lid, and very often that bird will have recovered, it will recompose itself, and it will be ready to fly off. So usually there's a there's a good chance that birds will recover what what you don't want is to leave the bird where it is where it is then vulnerable to your dog or cat coming along and eating it so we've spoken at large about the hardy dar ibis i want to quickly talk about uh, birds of prey um, and this again for some people in terms of rewilding their garden space can be a bit of a challenge uh, not too many people love to see uh, a kill in their garden, uh, as particularly, if, of it, particularly if it's one of their beloved uh, family bird members or particular bird they've got to come to know. But we have to accept that if we're really serious about rewilding, then actually the highest tribute we can, we can get for that is when these apex predators move in and they start preying upon the, the smaller life forms. And here I was documented in a, in a loose sort of way through these sketches, an incident where a black sparrowhawk came in and took one of the pair of spotted thick knees in the park opposite our house. And this was a pair that not only had we been watching and, and monitoring the breeding thing, but I'd been physically protecting those birds from the neighborhood Jack Russell Terriers. And so it was a bit disappointing that the, the, the sparrow chose the thickney, but that is the circle of life and that's the successful rewilding evidence. Talking about owls again briefly, um, any of you looking to, for information on, on creating habitats for owls and having them breed near you, I'd recommend Eco Solutions. Uh, you can find them easily on the web. They're doing terrific work, including in a lot of townships in Johannesburg, where not only providing uh, breeding sites for barn owls, which are fantastic rodent control uh, birds, but also doing terrific extension work and education work um, in those areas. A lot of you living in Johannesburg will be familiar with um, the, the spotted eagle owls at Delta Park, which Jeff Lockwood has been studying for many, many years, and many parts of the country where these owls are so uh, engaging to watch, and we all love to hear the sound of the owl, spotted eagle owl calling on our roof at night. Another owl story 
And then another example of rewilding in action is this sequence of events that played out in our Nelsprate garden. We were sitting outside one evening, having a meal on the deck, a little light on the wall, illuminating the table. And under the light was a tropical house gecko, which was coming to feed on some of the uh, insects that were being drawn in there. And out of the blue, a wood owl comes across the table, rises up and snatches the gecko right in front of us. And so these are the wonderful cameos and the marvelous um, incidents that you can have if you embrace all forms of nature living in your space. You also have to uh, perhaps accept that um, birds like the kukul are going to come in and they might rob nests that you've been anxious to see develop through the breeding cycle. But the kukul too has to make a living and he is, in addition to feeding on birds eggs, will be doing other and playing other roles in the ecosystem of an urban environment. And of course, who doesn't love the sound of the virtual kukul calling on a drizzly day? Now, doves and pigeons are the most, potentially usually the most abundant of birds in the urban environment. The laughing dove, the red-eyed dove, and this one here flying into screen is the speckled pigeon. And if you start putting seed out for birds, and a lot of people believe that uh, helping birds is putting seed out for them, pretty much all that's going to happen is you're going to get a mob of, of one or other species of dove, dove, or maybe all three species of dove. And these birds will just overwhelm your garden normally. And furthermore, the, the amount of seed that, the, that the, the pigeons and doves just cannot consume that gets left and pushed off to the side, then creates uh, a food source for feral rats and mice which then take up residence in your garden. They may prey upon bird eggs in, in a lot of cases, and they may prompt you or your neighbors to start looking for rodenticides, which are then is going to eliminate the owl and other species operating higher up the food web. So the idea of putting seed out for birds, uh, particularly in a, in a massive scale, I see people just throwing seed all over their driveways really is is not helping nature at all. Much better to enjoy one dusky flycatcher than 300 uh, laughing doves on a paved driveway. And of course the other flycatchers that will come into garden spaces, the paradise flycatcher and the little cape bassus. You can watch these little chaps for hours and very often these two species will nest quite comfortably very close to people and their homes. Very confiding uh, bird species. And here of course South Africa's favourite bird, the Cape Robin, as voted by the members of BirdLife South Africa. This one seems to have caught a spider. This shows you the layout here of the pages of the book where possible the juvenile plumage and any related species also depicted. Uh, other mini predators that you could have in your garden include these guys, the shrikes, um, the, the gray-headed bush shrike, which is more of a bush felt bird and the eastern parts of the country, they often target chameleons. So that's again going to be a conflict for you when you see a gorgeous bush shrike measuring up to your prized chameleon. But you have to let nature take its course. Of course, nectivores, we've spoken about sugar water feeders, the sunbirds, uh, they're attractive, they're brilliant, they're colorful. They also provide absolutely essential pollination services. And by drawing too many sunbirds into artificial feeding situations, we're distracting them from the main work, which is to actually pollinate aloes and other tubular plants. Another thing I can talk about in rewilding is the importance of leaving rotting branches on the ground and leaving some dead wood on the trees themselves. 
don't, you know, a lot of people feel they've got to tidy their garden up all the time and cut off these branches just because the branch is dead. If you do that, you're not going to allow birds such as the, the black collared barbet to find a niche. Uh, the barbets tend to make nest cavities in dead wood. They're not as powerful as a woodpecker. And what, I've, what I'm showing in this story here is something I witnessed again in our garden in Nalspread was a battle over several months between a family of black collared barbets and two different species of honey guide. And none of this would happen if you saw off the branch, the dead branch of, of one of your trees. Of course, if it's in a dangerous place, the branch has got to come down. But also think about just leaving long branches in your flower beds, in your gardens. Let the branch decompose. Many species depend on that. This is again a little bit maybe going off topic, but it's about seed feeding, the dangers of seed feeding. A lot of people don't like to see these little pintail gliders scaring everything else off in their garden. It's a very aggressive little guy. He likes to keep a harem of about six or so females and is, is anxious then to, to drive other birds away. Not only, not only other wider, male widers, but, but other species too. And most people who have a problem with a pintail wider are actually providing seed artificially in their gardens. And so either stop putting that out or make sure you've got a few feeding stations where the, the, the wider can't completely dominate. It can't be everywhere at once. So another aspect of gardening, extraordinary garden birds is uh, is uh, the, the marvelous things that can show up unexpectedly. And, and here are three examples. The Narina trogon is a bird that could pitch up in gardens in the eastern part of South Africa. Not too many people are going to see one on the washing line, um, but it's possible, as, as happened to us. And the Pell's fishing owl, this is Trevor Hardacre's photograph of a Pell's fishing owl that appeared in Newlands in Cape Town. And then at the bottom, the last record I can find or know about of a African pitter was in a garden in Barberton. And probably the next African pitter in South Africa will be in somebody's garden. So there's always a chance of seeing something extraordinary in a garden space. We nearly, I, I feel I've overrun a little. So I'm talking rather fast, sorry for that, but I'm conscious of the time. And uh, I just wanted to say that the, the second part of the book features plants and it's all about choosing and placing plants appropriately in your garden. Um, and examples of, of why each individual plant species would be suitable for birds. For example, on the right hand side, you can see the trunk of a paperbark thorn. You can only imagine how many species of of lizard and beetle are going to find a way to live in all that crackly bark. All these different plants and trees, if they're left in a, in a, in a wild state, will host the species that will build the foundation of your food pyramid. And um, I can recommend Wittkoppen Nursery in Gauteng as one of, one of the best nurseries for um, indigenous plants. But also go and visit your local botanical gardens and you get some inspiration there of what is going to grow particularly well in your environment. Obviously we want water-wise species where we can and the aloes come to mind for a lot of people. Please remember to leave the dried leaves on your aloe stems. Geckos live in there, scorpions and beetles will live in there, so leave those crinkly old dry leaves on the stem of your aloe where you can. And likewise with grasses, part of your garden could be put over to a few species of indigenous wild grasses and let those grasses seed and you'll get wax bills, possibly if you're lucky, even twin spots. Certainly mannequins are going to come in for the grasses. So to finish off, here are the seven habits of highly effective garden rewilders. Number one, grow as many plants native to your area as possible. Number two, let as much dead plant matter accumulate as you can tolerate, especially leaves. Number three, 
Don't cut off dead branches unless they pose a physical danger to your children or your pets. Number four, less lawn and less paving means more habitat for soil micro microbes and therefore more invertebrates. Number five, do not cut off dead or dying seed heads as they host many invertebrates and don't remove the dry leaves from aloe stems and palm trees. Number six, provide constant water. Build a water feature if you can. Number seven has gone missing. I don't know what happened when I was putting the presentation together. Finally, thank you very much. If you live in Johannesburg, take some time to go and visit Isdell House, BirdLife South Africa's head office for some inspiration. Tanya Anderson has made a beautiful indigenous garden there. Pop in, take a friend and get to know some of the people working at BirdLife and get some inspiration for your own garden. So thank you all very much for letting me go on tonight on the topic of rewilding. I hope there may be some questions and I hope that this has all gone off accordingly and that I haven't been talking to an, an empty room for the last, last hour or so. Are you out there, anyone? Mark? Duncan, yes, we are. And uh, can you stop sharing your screen, please, for a moment? Thanks. Ah. Thanks, Duncan. Thanks very much. Um, Okay, Duncan, that was absolutely brilliant. Thanks very, very much. Um, really appreciate that talk. And I tell you what, we almost maxed out on the number of people that could join by our Zoom package. We had just under, under 500 people. And I think most people were joining as couples. So, and there would be a lot via Facebook Live. So I think we pretty came pretty close to a thousand people, maybe even more than a thousand people listen to your talk um, this evening. So thanks very much, Duncan, for that excellent um, presentation. I um, got just a few things I'd like to say before we open up to questions. One is that I'm a little advert for a Duncan. I really love Duncan's vintage, vintage style poster prints. Go to his website and have a look at those and consider purchasing them. Thanks, uh, Duncan. So just a couple of announcements. I'm gonna run through a few slides at the end as I speak. Um, importantly, I need to announce that the winner of the November Jakarta Media Giveaway is Cheryl Woods. Well done, Cheryl, um, for the the hamper of books that you'll be receiving soon includes Robert's Geographic Variations, Field Guide to Southern Africa's Birds, Shorebirds of South Africa, and Insider's Guides to Photographing Birds in Southern Africa. So well done, um, Cheryl, on that prize. And just before we go to questions, there will be a, a opportunity for people to participate in a survey. At the end of the webinar, I'd like to encourage you please to, to complete the survey, to add some information for us so we can understand a little bit more about the participants of these um, webinars. Then um, there's a few, I, I was looking at the people that joined us during the presentation. We had people from all over South Africa, which we're very grateful for, but really nice to see so many people from around the world, France, Netherlands, Serbia, Swaziland, Belgium, UK, and Atlanta. And then uh, some South Africans that I didn't uh, welcome, Jess Suri from University of Cape Town, finalizing a PhD. Jess, nice to see you there and thanks for your nice comment. Temba from Temba's Birding and Eco Tours in Zululand, um, one of our top bird guides, posted some nice comments as well. Ali Rasmussen, one of South Africa's, uh, one of Africa's top birders was also there. And then Pamela Isdal, one of BirdLife South Africa's um, four honorary patrons joined from Atlanta. Thanks very much for joining us, Pamela. We appreciate your, your time as well. And then uh, this is the last webinar of the year. We're going to take a bit of a break over the next few weeks, recharge our batteries, and we will certainly be back in early in the year. Our first webinar in the year will be about Bird of the Year 2021. And we just keep an eye on our social media posts, um, our website, our e -news newsletters, and so on to find out more about um, the webinars in 2021. But we're going to keep these um, going. Okay, Duncan, we've got, a, we've got quite a few questions um, and I'm going to start off just maybe firstly just reply to Butch Davis's question about Bird of the Year 2021, which we'll actually be announcing that on Saturday, really big day. So there's a, we're all ready with a very nice media release, hopefully get into some of the newspapers, um, really nice Bird of the Year for next year. So watch out for the announcement and also the poster in our magazine next year. And of course, then also... Um, the articles and, and merchandise that we'll be selling. I'd like to also, just before I go to the questions, just to encourage you all to support BirdLife South Africa. Many of you do, many of you are members, 
we need all the support we can get in the important work that we do, which is the conservation of our country's birds. Okay, there's a few questions, Duncan. I'm going to start with um, Ellen. She asked about the benefits of providing sugar water for birds. Uh, what are the benefits? Why would we want to provide sugar water for birds? Well, Ellen, to be honest, I can't think there are any benefits, uh, to be honest. Um, I think that uh, the only benefits that would come would be to the people watching the birds. And as I mentioned in the talk, not everyone has got the opportunity perhaps to grow uh, nectarous plants in their garden. Some older folk who are living now in very small um, uh, homes who, who would get some joy out of watching birds coming to sugar water feeders. Uh, but over and above that, I don't know of any benefits to birds to be feeding on that. It has been shown not to be harmful, but the real benefits for birds are feeding on wild plants because there they, they perform their ecological role and they pollinate and they, and they, um, they engage with, with the flora that they evolved alongside. Yeah, thanks, Duncan. Okay, there's a, there's a really important question, and this is the one I really appreciated by Henny Fisser and uh, quite a few other people, including Penny Abbott, has asked a similar question. Is one's garden enough is really the question. So Henny says his neighbors are pavings, they use insecticides. Will his, benef will his, will his efforts have any impact? Duncan. Yeah, thank you. That, thanks for that question. It's a very key question, and it's 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 uh, it is one that we need to one, wonder about. Um, uh, we are fighting a wave of of um, you know of destruction around us, and of of people who are not environmentally conscious. So we're always going to be confronted with that. But we must remember, I think, as well, that a lot of a lot of the smaller creatures. Um, the butterflies, the dragonflies, the, the cicadas, the, the termites, they're able to move, they're, back, they're able to move through, through the air and they're able to, to find habitats in the way we would use stepping stones to cross a big river. So I think, I think we, have to, we have to live in hope that by creating a, a biodiverse garden ourselves, a, a little sanctuary for nature. We have to live in hope that there'll be another one of those not too far away to which the species that are breeding on our plot can move and back and forward and so forth. So that we would create these uh, little corridors which are not necessarily joined but are not that far enough that they're broken, not that far enough apart that they're broken. So. Yeah, it's it's it is it is it is the biggest challenge I think for us if we are looking at rewilding, but it's it's part of being hopeful and it's part of engaging and growing an interest among people in your neighbourhood and talking about nature in general and the work that work that BirdLife and others are doing in particular. Okay, yeah, thanks, thanks, thank you for that answer. And I I think what we can do is encourage our neighbours to grow indigenous plants by telling them that the indigenous plants need less water and less maintenance as well. So you actually reduce your costs and uh, water is going to become scarcer and scarcer in, in future. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a question around cats. Um, Philip has asked, um, do you have any tips for keeping neighbors, one's neighbor's cats out of the garden, out of your garden? Um, well, actually, the topic of cats is a bit like the sugar water feeders. It's a very hot topic um, and a lot of people have divergent views on it. And I know, I know that um, some studies have recently been done in, in uh, I think in Cape Town, regarding the impact that the cats have in terms of predation on garden birds. Clearly, if you're gonna attract birds in your, to your garden, um, the neighbor's cats are going to be drawn in there. Um, and so you're running the risk of, of, of cat predation. I don't know that it's easy to control. I don't think that, that most people can control the movements of their own cats. 
and they, you know, they're obviously able to scale high walls and get over fences and they can get anywhere. So I don't have any particular tips to offer on keeping cats out other than what I can say is that, you know, having dogs in your garden is usually a great deterrent for cats. <laughs> so a resident bulldog will tend to keep most cats out. But the whole topic of whether cats are actually detrimental to birds is also interesting. And, you know, one could probably do a whole, a whole um, webinar on, on the impact that cats are having on birds in urban environments. We know, we know that cats have a massive detrimental impact in small closed ecosystems, um, particularly places where there are no native mammals or predatory mammals, especially in Australia and New Zealand. Um, but in Africa and in big cities around Africa, I don't know that there's much evidence of cats um, causing local extinctions of any particular birds or otherwise knocking bird populations back to any significant level. I'm not a cat person. I don't have a cat. Um, but it's an interesting, an interesting debate for sure. Yeah. So, and you know, Roy um, Tustin has actually said, you know, catching the bells around the necks or possibly also um, what they call scrunchies, I think, which are quite useful. It makes the cat more obvious to the approaching, the stalking um, uh, bird. So there's other ways in which you can make, uh, you can reduce the depredation. It's also reptiles that these cats are feeding on. And some interesting work has certainly been done. Dr. Ali Halajian, who's actually moved down to Joburg from the University of North in the last few weeks, has asked a couple of questions about aloe species that are endemic to Johannesburg. According to plant, I suppose he's newly purchased or newly moved in garden. And are there any books on native indigenous plants of Johannesburg? Can you answer that, Duncan? Yes. Um, certainly one of the things that's happened in the last um, few years is, is a lot of nurseries are now making hybridized aloes uh, because they're, they're, you know, they're, they seem to be more um, robust and they, they flower for longer periods. I think that's a bit of a, a sad event. Um, it's always nicer to get a, a pure species um, because, again, as part of the whole rewilding and hosting of a, of a full spectrum of biodiversity, you'd want, you'd want the aloe actually to be parasitized. You'd want, you'd want its seeds to be parasitized by a certain beetles. And, and by selecting and buying some of these stronger um, horticulturally enhanced aloes, um, I think, I think uh, you, you actually not achieving that goal. In Johannesburg, if I'm not mistaken, aloe arborescence, aloe marlothi, and um, a couple of others are native to the Vitvatas Rand and will thrive and do well because a big enemy of aloes is frost. So if you get aloe species that are uh, from more tropical, subtropical environments, the sap in those aloes is not adapted to very cold winters and that when that freezes that can kill off the aloe. In terms of a book, many years ago there was a little book called Trees and Shrubs of the Vitvatas Rand and that's something that can still be seen in second-hand bookstores and um, in terms of another another publication specifically on the on the aloes of of the high felt of Johannesburg I'm not too sure but I would go to Fitcopper Nursery or some of the well-known indigenous nurseries and ask for their advice on that particular subject. Yeah, thanks, uh, Duncan. And in fact, there's a number of indigenous nurseries in Johannesburg and I um, could just mention Random Harvest, which provided literally all of the plants for uh, Isle House Bird Love South Africa's head office, Grow Wild and um, Fitcopper and Wildflower Nursery. And there are others too. And I think they'll be pleased to, to give some advice. Um, Jess, um, Siri has asked a, a couple of questions. One is about um, wondering whether we'll ever get to a stage where neighborhoods can become stewardship areas of connected gardens where these kind of issues won't be such an issue. And uh, Jess, it's something that we've actually been talking about at BirdLife South Africa, and I don't know whether my friend 
and uh, past chairman Vernon Head is listening in. But uh, we have some really, really exciting plans um, to actually achieve some of that. But of course, it's all funding um, dependent. So maybe one day, Jess. And then uh, Tanya, as I said, she pointed out to me, there's a whole lot of aloes that one can grow in Gauteng and Joburg. Hello, great head eye. Um, and Eclone uh, are just two more of the species to add to those that you, you mentioned, um, Duncan. Okay, we've got um, this um, question from Mark, uh, my namesake. Um, some of these indigenous trees and plants attract foreign pests. He calls like Asian woolly aphids and Christmas beetles. How does one treat uh, these um, as some of the birds don't seem to be interested in, in eating, feeding on them? Yes, um, this is one of the one of the great challenges that we're faced with all over the planet: is, is these invader species, invasive plants, and the the Bora beetles um, in South Africa have arrived. We've we've heard stories of these minuscule uh, beetles that are targeting particular trees, and they're not. They're not being preyed upon. There's no, there's no natural control mechanism in nature for species that haven't evolved here. And that's why you get the proliferation of, of those invertebrates. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what the question in particular is, other than that, you know, we, we, we do have a problem with, with uh, invader, non-invasive, I mean, non-indigenous species, they, they, a lot of them are being studied. And I think, I think one of the things we've got to, we've got to hope for as environmentalists in the future is that the new generation, the young generation of, of um, environmentally conscious uh, scientists that are being bred now at our schools and universities are going to are going to find the tools and the technology to combat environmental problems that for us right now seem quite insurmountable. Um, but I do believe in the future, things like biocontrol are going to be fine tuned and are, we're gonna be able to push back against invader species in ways that we haven't yet imagined. And therefore, all the more reason for us to now create these little reservoirs of biodiversity in our own garden spaces because it's from these spaces and from the interconnected corridors of these little biodiversity reservoirs even those in our own tiny little gardens it's from those spaces that in the future the native species can then emerge they can re-emerge you might look at it almost as if in the way that certain birds and animals were taken out of the wild, put into a captive situation, only later to be released back into a, into a landscape that was more uh, forgiving for them. And the California condor was the most famous example of that. Yeah. So at the garden rewilding scale, I would say there's a purpose in what I'm talking about tonight, in that if we can create, if we can keep and maintain these reservoirs of biodiversity in the future, there's the potential then at least for that bigger recolonization. Thanks, Duncan. Um, there's a last uh, question from Jess Siri, which I will answer. And that's just, you know, a lot of people are planting pectranthuses and these homogenous stands as well. And um, I think that's not always beneficial to, to wildlife and gardens. And I think you know, the key is to try and grow what used to occur there naturally. And I know that that's certainly what we been trying to promote um, through outfits at Isdal House and, um, and some of the extension work that we've been doing in, in Johannesburg. So I think we've, we've come to an end, um, Duncan, and I think that was absolutely brilliant. Um, an absolutely brilliant presentation. I'm glad it's going to be uploaded into YouTube in the next few days by Melissa, and the presentation will be available to other people to, to watch. I did tell Duncan this after the presentation at the Bird Fair that um, you know, I'd love It'd be great if every gardener in the country could listen to, to this talk. Uh, we can all do our little bit. Clearly we can um, and plant a few indigenous plants, remove some of those, those uh, exotic plants, which are no benefit um, to, to nature and also spread the word. So just to end off, anybody living in Gauteng, I suppose when COVID is over, please come and visit us at Isdal House, look at our garden and also come and purchase at our shop. 
for those who aren't members of BirdLife South Africa, please uh, become a member. We need all the support we can get. Times are going to be tough in future. We need the, um, the numbers of people behind us as we fight unsustainable developments. We do need um, your support. And uh, support Duncan and his books and also the, the wonderful posters um, that he produces. I'd like to thank everybody for attending. Uh, we've had a wonderful turnout tonight. Um, just under 500 people on on Zoom, which probably translates into about a thousand because most are sitting watching as couples, Duncan, and then a whole lot more watching via Facebook Live. And once again, Duncan, um, you're a great friend of, of mine and of BirdLife South Africa's, and I've really enjoyed the interactions I've had with you pretty much over the last uh, 30 years. And uh, thanks for your presentation tonight. It's been excellent. Thank you. And thanks everyone for tuning in. Cheers. You're welcome. Thank you very much.